All right, everyone, I'm giving it another couple minutes here as we're seeing everybody getting logged on. All right, I'm going to kick us off here in an effort to keep us on time so that we make sure we have time for questions at the end. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first ever NANS APP webinar. We're so excited and pleased to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight, we have an excellent panel with us as we discuss a complex neuromodulation case. My name is Chelsea Hoffman. I'm a physician assistant at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I will be serving as the moderator of tonight's discussion. I've been involved in NANS for several years, and I've worked in both inpatient and outpatient pain medicine for about eight years, and now full-time as faculty with the Mayo Clinic Physician Assistant Program. And so with that, before I have our panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to lay the webinar ground rules. So go ahead and type any questions that you have during our discussion tonight into the chat box, and we'll do our best to answer those as they come in. Questions will be answered not only at the end of the webinar, but certainly if I see ones that are pertinent to what the panelists are talking about, I'll make sure that I bring those up when I can. The audience will be kept on mute throughout the webinar. You'll see the panelists coming off of mute and, and back on again as they try to eliminate any background noise as well. The webinar recording will be available on the NANS YouTube channel and on the NANS website approximately 48 hours after the webinar ends. And so with that, I would like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves. We'll start off with Camilla. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Camilla Binks, and I'm a nurse practitioner in Scottsdale, Arizona with Arizona Pain. Um, I have about eight to 10 years of pain management and orthopedic experience. And the clinic that I work in is mostly a comprehensive interventional pain practice. My disclosures are I do do consulting for NALU, Nevro, and Boston Scientific. Hey guys, my name is Ashley. I am um, a physician assistant by trade. Um, I have about eight years of experience primarily within neurosurgery. Um, I just completed my MBA um, earlier this year, um, but my current role is at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute in West Virginia, where my primary focus is with the treatment of movement disorders um, using deep brain stimulation as well as um, high intensity focused ultrasound. But I also have a role in research, which includes the um, treatment or potential treatment options for Alzheimer's disease, as well as patients with opioid addiction. And we are using both ultrasound um, and deep brain stimulation to do so. All right, my name is Brian Johnson. I've got uh, no financial disclosures. Uh, I've been a PA for 18 years. I've got experience in cardiovascular and thoracic surgery, orthopedic trauma surgery, and neurosurgery. I'm currently the chief neurosurgery PA for Advanced Pain Care in Round Rock, Texas. We are a multi-specialty practice that includes pain management, neurosurgery, neurology, orthopedic surgery, rheumatology, behavioral health, and anesthesiology. We're the largest implanter of spinal cord stimulators in the United States. We extend, extend from Katy, Texas near Houston, uh, up to Austin, uh, Round Rock and Waco, all the way north into Amarillo. All right, thank you, panelists. 
So I'm going to get us started with our objectives for covering this complex neuromodulation case study. And we have an amazing case tonight that covers so many different aspects of neuromodulation, how to troubleshoot the failure of a spinal cord stimulator therapy. And at the end of this, you should be able to list the risk factors for patients that would impact the decision whether to implant a neuromodulation device, such as a spinal cord stimulator, deep brain stimulator, or other neuromod device and be able to explain treatment options for management of tremors, which I know that not all PAs, if you're not working in certain subspecialties, would be familiar with. So by the end of this, you will be. So with that, we'll go ahead and have Ashley introduce the case. Okay, guys. Um, so this is a case that we actually um, saw um, at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. Um, so hopefully you learn a little something as we go through it. But Essentially, um, this is a 56-year-old right-handed female. She had a history of morbid obesity, uncontrolled diabetes, with her last A1C being, or not last, but the presenting A1C uh, being 10.3. She had failed back syndrome, status post lumbar fusion, as well as chronic pain, status post a spinal cord implant. Um, and I will note there that it was a non-functioning system. Uh, she presented to our functional neurosurgery clinic with complaints of right greater than left-sided hand tremors. And they started over 25 years ago, um, progressive in nature, to the point she had trouble holding a newspaper, writing and eating, which is very typical for people with tremors, um, essential tremors primarily. Um, and the tremor disabled her from her job as an administrative assistant. So uh, typically what we do is we have, you know, the primary medicines that you would treat tremor with, and you can see those there. Um, unfortunately, they did not help control her tremors and several of them were contraindicated because of her comorbidities. So at this point, we're talking kind of about surgery. Um, and as with any patient visit, we have to figure out what their vitals are. And you can see down at the bottom, her blood pressure is a little high, uh, 160 over 102. Her temperature was normal, uh, pulse 105, height five foot six. And I will um, give you a little hint and point that her weight uh, was 321 pounds with a BMI of about 52. Um, I kind of gave it away, uh, but she was diagnosed with a central tremor, um, and due to the ongoing severity and refractory nature um, with the medications, she was offered surgical intervention in the form of um, one, which was deep brain stimulation, or two, high-intensity focused ultrasound. Um, we will hear that referred to as HIFU or MR-guided focused ultrasound, and you can see the kind of abbreviations there just so you're familiar. Um, the benefits of each one is, you know, and we have this conversation with all of the patients that are interested in surgery, is deep brain stimulation has been around for over 25 years. Um, it's got flexible programming, so flexible um, and increased ability um, to change settings as the tremor changes, and if there's a side effect, you can always program around that. So it gives our patients a lot of options and benefit. You can also treat bilateral hand tremors. Um, although it does carry a higher risk of um, surgical risk, I would say, being it is an open procedure, it does require an implant, um, incisions which increase the risk of infection as well as hemorrhage, and deep brain stimulation does require more follow-up than um, in comparison the high-intensity focused ultrasound. Um, this procedure has been around for about six years. Uh, it is a permanent lesioning procedure, so really no flexibility um, as the patient changes or ages or as the tremor changes, there's no ability to adjust um, the impact that the procedure has on tremor. Um, as I mentioned, it is less invasive. Um, there is no incision, so minimal risk of infection, or excuse me, no risk of infection and minimal risk of hemorrhage. Um, but it must be done in a 3T or a 1.5T MRI system. Um, and I'll just kind of give it away. At West Virginia, we have a 3.5 or a 3, 3T MRI. All right, we can move it to the next slide. Thank you for laying the foundation for us with that case, Ashley. And so I'm going to pose the first question to Brian specifically and ask Brian, with your neurosurgical expertise and all of your years seeing pre-op, post-op patients, what kind of glaring issues are present to you right off the bat with this case? Some of the um, most glaring issues, uh, Chelsea, are, you know, the morbid obesity with a BMI of near 52. Uh, that with the uncontrolled diabetes of 10.3, there's very little chance that we'd be trying to take this patient to surgery. The risk reward is way too high with that alone. 
But with that uh, morbid obesity, uncontrolled diabetes, the other thing that we would be questioning is whether or not there were any other pulmonary or cardiac issues involved. Um, I would be surprised if there weren't, uh, based upon that. Uh, were there any other cardiac comorbidities, Ashley? I'm on mute. Um, she did have quite a few things going on. So hypertension, coronary artery disease. Um, I believe she also had a history of an MI. Um, her comorbidities were pretty lengthy to list on the introductory um, case, but yes. Yeah, so from a surgical standpoint, I mean, she would be a, an extremely high risk, if not a, not a surgical candidate at all, based upon that alone. We'd need at least primary care, cardiac, possibly even get pulmonary involved. Uh, and then endocrinology to help get the hemoglobin A1C down to at least below 7.5. That is our level before we even take anybody into surgery. That's super helpful. So certainly phoning a friend, referring her to your specialist, and then p potentially bringing her back for follow-up at another point in time to rediscuss if she's even a candidate, if she's been able to meet some of those uh, metrics. The audience question that I have at this time, and certainly you can either feel free audience to think about this in your head or if you'd like to throw a response in the chat, but knowing how Ashley set the stage with this case and what you heard Brian speak of just now, what option, deep brain stimulation or the high intensity focused ultrasound, would you choose for this patient and why? And if you don't feel like throwing it in the chat just yet, that's fine. But we just want to pose that question to you so you can kind of start mulling it over. Maybe some of you already have an answer, though, if you have expertise with those treatment options in your area. All right, keep thinking about it. And I'm going to go ahead and let them flip us to the next slide. Okay, so um, as I mentioned in the case introduction, um, the patient did have a spinal cord stimulator. Um, so when we talk about doing surgery, um, you know, you got to think about, you know, is this is the spinal cord stimulator really doing anything? And it had been turned off for many years. Um, however, it was a Boston Scientific system, um, which we discovered was non-compatible for any MRI conditions whatsoever. So no matter what, with the spinal cord stimulator, she was not going to be able to um, have an ultrasound. And in order to undergo high resolution imaging for DBS, she thought, you know, I'd rather have it taken out to ensure the best possible outcome and um, improvement in my tremors. All right. Thanks, Ashley. So the next question that I have, this one's going to go to Camilla. I know that many of you out there probably have seen this happen before as well, right? Where you have a patient that comes in and states that they have a non-functioning spinal cord stimulator. And certainly the advanced practice provider has to have some sort of algorithmic approach or process that they go through, maybe specific to their institution or maybe something they formulated with their team of what steps to take when this happens, when we see this with patients. And so Camilla, tell us a little bit about what you would do if you had a patient come in and say that their device was not functioning or had been shut off for any period of time. Thanks, Ashley. So for um, for this patient that if she were to come into Arizona pain um, and state that she has a stimulator that's not functioning. The first thing that we try to find out is, does she know what what vendor um, she's implanted with? And then tracking down the uh, representative for that vendor to interrogate the device and see if it's truly non-functioning or maybe the battery's dead. Um, and then having the, the rep interrogate the device. And then we also get imaging, usually x-rays, um, AP and lateral x-rays of the thoracic and lumbar spine just to see if it's in the right place. Um, and ultimately, in, in uh, interventional pain, we're trying to help the patient with their pain. So if they have a stimulator, like what other options are there for you to treat your pain? And um, in interventional pain, we're always thinking about, well, if it's not working and it was working at one point, can we then explant it and implant it with a different device? 
Camilla, I like what you said there. You certainly brought up the imaging, bringing in your team to determine the next steps in their care plan and bringing in the device company representative. But one of the key things that I think that you just hit on there was if the device was ever working, is there a way that we can get the patient back to that pain control that they were having? And so that's one of the things that I would challenge the audience to think about here is how do you handle patients with a quote unquote non-functioning spinal cord stimulator or other neuromodulation device, do you take the time to ask some more of those probing questions as far as what does non-functioning mean? Does it mean that the device won't turn on at all? Did it ever turn on? Did you have pain relief at some point in the past immediately after it was put in? And, and how great of pain control was that? Is that something that you'd like to get back to? So I think it leads us down this like rabbit hole of all these other additional questions, right? Because people can say, oh, it's not working it, or it, it never worked. And then once you start kind of probing them with some of those questions, it's like, wait a second. Yes, it actually did work at one time. And you, we do see documented maybe in the past that you actually did have really good pain relief. So certainly a lot of other questions to ask along the way. And with that, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so um, the moral of the story is the spinal cord stimulator was not MRI compatible. And in this patient's um, situation, she never had really any significant relief. So um, again, she did elect to have this removed um, in order to have the higher resolution imaging for um, deep brain stimulation or even undergo the high intensity focused ultrasound. Um, I will again note that the ultrasound that we have here at West Virginia is a 3T, um, although these can also be done on a 1.5. So if you ever saw a patient with um, a stimulator that was a, compatible at 1.5, you could certainly um, get them in touch with a, a facility that does that. Um, so again, she elected to have the stimulator removed. Um, additionally, I will add that she was working on her health during this workup, this was quite a lengthy process to go through and having these discussions with both her and her family. Um, but she did improve her glucose and her A1C at this point in time uh, was 7.3. Just I will mention she wasn't able to get her weight significantly down. Um, so uh, just an FYI there, but unfortunately, as we all know, as APPs and dealing with patients, it is never just that easy. So she underwent um, explantation of the spinal cord stimulator. Um, unfortunately, she did have a superficial wound dehiscence at the inferior portion of the thoracic incision. Um, fortunately, uh, the patient's wound did heal without any additional surgical interventions. So we're kind of moving into post-operative care again, which certainly is an area of Brian's expertise. And so Brian, I'd like to know, when you see patients in follow-up after procedures, what features or characteristics of wounds would make you concerned and or when would you decide to loop in the implanting physician? Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. So usually we don't loop in the implanting provider um, unless it becomes a deep infection where we're starting to worry about meningitis, uh, something to that nature. Otherwise, we're just watching the wound healing, uh, check wound, uh, labs, uh, CBC, CMP, ESR, uh, CRP, and then try to determine, you know, is it truly a superficial infection? Uh, is, there, is it a suture abscess uh, or is there a deeper infection? that would require in hospitalization uh, with aggressive IND, uh, with IV antibiotics. And then at that point, if it's getting to the point where they need to go to the hospital, then we're definitely going to start looping in the implanting uh, provider. Uh, but usually we wouldn't do that until that time. You know, the other thing we have to consider is reimplantation. You know, when are we going to reimplant it? If it's not a deep infection, or there's no infection at all, then we can wait about six weeks. If there's an infection, then Usually we will also get infectious disease involved because with the with the bugs that are out there nowadays, I know that that's above above my realm. Um, and we would wait at least three months after the infection is cleared, the antibiotics have been completed, and then infectious disease is given the okay to proceed forward. 
Okay, so you kind of answered both of our questions there in some ways. So I'm hearing you say that if it's like a simple um, wound issue that can be managed without antibiotics or surgical intervention, possibly they could go under re-implant of a device within about three weeks, you said? Is that right? About six weeks. Sorry, six weeks. Okay. But if there was something more involved that you needed the expertise of infectious disease or something like that, then it would be extended to even three months. Three, even up to six months. Yeah. Camilla and Especially Ashley, for, do you have similar issues or um, what should I say, requirements in your practice as far as going from one device to the next as far as the timeline in between those devices? We, we do um, you know we're, we're putting implants in people's brains so we if it's if we're re-implanting in the brain it can be a little more lengthy um, yeah. between cases and, and even so if we remove say someone had a deep brain stimulator we do sometimes think about offering them ultrasound because there was a reason this device was explanted um, so that's a really good utility of you know ultrasound is it offers um, an additional treatment without the hardware um, secondarily, if it's something that's not directly um, intracranial, like an extension lead or an IPG, if we're concerned about infection, um, if we think we can save the intracranial device, we will do that. Um, treat them with, you know, antibiotics, get infectious disease on board, typically IV antibiotics. Um, you know, more times than not, it's, it's the infection's going to seed through. Um, but we do currently have one patient that that happened to, but she's actually doing very, very well. Um, and we're going to reimplant her extension in IPG here in the next few weeks, um, but that's only been about three months. Um, so as long as infectious disease gives them the clearance to go forward, and we're happy with wounds and everything like that, we're happy to reimplant. Camilla, what yeah. about you? I would say similar. We don't deal with uh, deep brain stimulation in our practice, um, but as far as like SES explant or removal. If there's no infection um, and we're just doing like earlier when I mentioned if, if the patient was getting relief and we want to explant the device and, and implant a different device, you can do that at the same visit. Patients in you know the OR, you explant one device and implant another. Um, as far as time between two different devices, I think the standard is six weeks as long as there's no infection. Um, yeah. And I agree with both Brian and Ashley that um, if there's a deeper infection, then obviously getting infectious disease involved is, is the best option. Perfect. Thank you guys for your opinions on that one. And to the audience, certainly, if you have different requirements within your practice or a different time frame that you all follow or any interesting pearls, certainly feel free to share those in the chat so that others can learn from your teams as well. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll let Ashley take it. All right, so um, as a reminder, she was interested in either HIFU or deep brain stimulation. Um, those, you can see her vitals there, I won't go through them again. She, like I said, wasn't able to reduce her, her weight or BMI that much, but did have a significant reduction in her A1C um, from 10.3 down to 7.3 um, after having multiple conversations with endocrinology, changing medications and, and multiple conversations with us as well. Um, so in order to get HIFU, one of the points I wanted to bring up here is that you have to have a skull density ratio that is within a range that enables us to get enough energy through the skull into the brain to create a permanent lesion. Um, so you can see that her SDR uh, was 0 0.57, which is absolutely within range. Um, it's pretty good, actually. It's kind of the sweet spot that we look for. We do want the SDR to be above 0 0.4. Um, so the pearl and the kind of note I want you to takeaway here is that despite this being a really good option for patients maybe who can't have DBS or a failed DBS as far as like an infection or a complication goes, um, there is a possibility that not everyone is a candidate for the procedure. So you do have to have this special CT scan um, to get that skull density calculation. And what it is, is it's a ratio of cortical to cancellous bone. Um, and that's the hard bone to the, the soft bone. Um, and that can prevent, like I said, enough energy getting through the skull to create that permanent lesion. Um, so despite improvement in her A1C, removal of the spinal cord stimulator and the acceptable SDR, uh, unfortunately, she was not able to lose enough weight to have the ultrasound procedure. As many of us know, there are weight limits um, on beds and things like that. In particular, the ultrasound is done in the MRI suite. So the weight limit on our MRI bed is about 270 pounds. And she, as you can see, was 300. Um, 
So just based on body habitus alone, we couldn't offer her the ultrasound. Um, so we did have an in-depth discussion with her, you know, about the risks of, of deep brain stimulation and, um, you know, her health. And, and we did get cardiac on board uh, to, you know, ensure we had the appropriate clearances. Um, but I'll let you take it away before I give the uh, ending of the case. Sure, we can go to the next slide. All right, so this one's going back to Brian and then Camilla as well. I'll have you guys weigh in here. So Ashley brought up a great point about practices having limits set for BMI as far as when they will or they will not consider doing an interventional procedure. And sometimes even our tables in our procedure suites have weight restrictions on them as well. So I was curious in your practices, what is that cutoff where you're like, you know, I don't think we feel comfortable doing that. Let's have Brian go first. Uh, our BMI cutoff is about 45. If depending upon what it is, we may extend it up to 50, but 50 is pretty much a, a hard cutoff. Anything over 50 we're not we're not going to have the capabilities to have them on the operating table without without problems. Camilla, what about you? So for our um, our weight limit for the table is 450 pounds. Um, the weight limit, or excuse me, the BMI limit is is the same. Anything greater than 50, we're not going to do. However, um, that's for sedation only. So if the patient is under 450 pounds and they don't want sedation, they can have a procedure done um, at our procedure center with risk. All right. That's helpful. Thank you. So an audience question again, you can throw this in the chat, you can think about it, but what about your practice? Do you know if your practice has a BMI or weight limit set to determine eligibility for procedures? Or do you happen to know what your table limits are in your operating suites? Certainly that is something that an APP should know because a lot of times we're the ones seeing them in the clinic, clearing them for procedures. And so having that information at the front of your mind or posted somewhere uh, in your office space is very helpful to you and to the members of your team or as you're orienting new team members too. So we can go ahead and advance to the next slide here. Go ahead, um, Ashley. Yep, sorry about that. So uh, deep, we did revisit deep brain stimulation in this patient. You know, as I said, her tremors were very severe and medically refractory, you know, disabling her from her job and many activities of daily living. Um, and she was only 56. So because she was able to reduce her A1C and we did get the necessary clearances, um, we did offer her, um, you know, deep brain stimulation and we did a unilateral implant. We did not do simultaneous bilateral as this increases her risks. So we did a unilateral um, DBS and that enabled her to get both sides treated as well as enable her to have the flexible programming because of her age. Um, I did want to include here, this is just a table that you can quickly reference as far as the differences between high intensity focus ultrasound and deep brain stimulation. Um, so just kind of in summary, the patient, you know, she's a 56 year old young lady, was able to um, improve her health. Um, so despite trying all of our typical tremor medicines, which you would want to go through, you know, at least the two heavy hitters, if you were, um, you know, treating someone with tremor in the clinic, um, primidone and propranolol primarily. Unfortunately, there are contraindications to those medications. Um, secondarily would be gabapentin, Topomax. You can use, um, you know, things like Ativan and, and other benzodiazepines as well, but use, using those in moderation obviously is very important. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, she wasn't able to tolerate any of those medicines or they did not pro provide relief. So the surgical interventions that you see most often are going to be the high intensity focus ultrasound and deep brain stimulation. Um, so again, permanent lesioning versus adjustable stimulation. One has hardware, one does not. Um, one is minimally invasive. I would, I, I hesitate to say non-invasive because anything in the brain is, you know, invasive. Um, but certainly deep brain stimulation is more invasive and carries higher risks um, as far as intraoperative surgical risks. Um, obviously both have side effects. The benefit of deep brain stimulation is you get the option to um, program around any side effects, whereas high intensity focus ultrasound is a, a permanent lesioning. So if you get a side effect, I always say the only thing that's going to make it better is time. Um, I can't give you a pill and I can't um, change any settings to make it go away. Um, the benefits are about the same for each. Uh, we, we always estimate about an 80% reduction in tremor. Um, 
on both sides of the spectrum for that. But obviously we we do see, and as many of you probably do see, there there are cases where you get more than that, you know, 95, 100% and some, you know, you shoot for 50 and that's good enough. Um, so in conclusion, she did undergo a left-sided, like I said, unilateral, and VIM is the target that we use for patients with um, essential tremor. It's in the thalamus and specifically the ventralis intermedius. Um, and she had very good improvements in her right-handed tremor with no wound dehiscence, I would say, or cardiac event or pulmonary event related to the, the DBS surgery. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you, Ashley. Before we move on to our q and A, I'm going to take us back to our objectives just for a moment so we can kind of come full circle and wrap things up for the audience. So our first objective, describing approaches to troubleshooting failure of spinal cord stimulator therapy. I think certainly number one is asking those probing questions of the patient, finding out if it actually is non-functioning, was it ever functioning, what has that timeline been of the device. And from there, phoning in our friendly device uh, company representative so that they can do some checking of impedances and find out if it's a functioning system for us, getting some imaging, and then certainly discussing with the team as far as what are we going to do next. Anything that I missed there that one would add? Anything from my panelists? Did I miss anything on that first objectives? First objective? I don't think so. Okay. Risk factors for how to decide whether or not to implant a neuromodulation device. Certainly, we all know if they are currently infected or prone to infections, that's a red flag right off the bat. We saw with this patient the elevated BMI, the elevated uncontrolled hemoglobin A1C, and difficulties with getting that under control in addition to their weight, but also cardiac risk factors, pulmonary risk factors, and um, other things. Any other risk factors that make any of you concerned when you are reading through a patient's chart or seeing somebody in the clinic as far as whether or not to implant a device? We always, we do worry about social support and making sure that someone has the ability to, number one, take care of their implant, they understand it, um, and also in the event that, you know, maybe they get put into a nursing home or in the future their cognition significantly declines, is there someone that can be there to help them? Yeah, I was just going to mention uh, behavioral health issues too. You know, we always do a beha behavioral health evaluation before we implant spinal cord stimulators. And I'm not sure if that's the same for deep brain stimulation, if you guys require it, behavioral health yeah. eval. Yeah. We always need to get a neuropsych kind of clearance and evaluation prior just so we, you know, look at the whole patient. Right. Those are great points and certainly ne not necessarily something that we hit on right off the bat when we were discussing this case. I would add uh, patient cognitive uh, status as far as their understanding of how to operate the device and do they have the dexterity to do things like, for example, if they need to reach behind them to do charging or are they able to operate the remote? Do they have the know-how, uh, the, the savviness to run some of the tech that goes into that? Now, certainly some of the devices are more or less complicated than others, but all of those things go into those decisions, whether or not they're risk factors certainly is up for debate, but they do need to be taken into consideration consideration. And then I feel like we got a great understanding, at least for me, for someone that doesn't deal as much with tremors, on the options that are out there. I didn't even know that a couple of these things uh, existed or were, you know, first-line medications that you would want to try. So that was really helpful to review. And with that, Let's go ahead and advance to our next slide. We're going to open it up for audience Q&A. Anything that anyone would like to ask our panelists? I'm looking right now in the chat. One of the questions that had come in were any site concerns for DBS as in spinal cord stimulation. I think we answered that already. Ashley said that yes, indeed, they do get psych uh, consultation and clearance from psych before they will consider implanting devices. Is that correct, Ashley? That is correct. And we, I mean, it, we have a multidisciplinary approach where, you know, we, we have neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsych, neuroradiology, social work, physical therapy, all on board um, with a core team that we use. And even if someone's not maybe optimal during the time of their evaluation, we often do recommend additional treatments. And then um, in the future, patients do switch into, you know, once they manage their depression 
or anxiety a little bit better. Um, you know, and you always, you know, think about drinking as well. We think about, you know, patients who are alcoholics, maybe reducing the amount of alcohol they're drinking. So there's a lot that goes into it um, that might rule you out as a candidate initially, but then, you know, after a little bit of treatment, um, they do flip into that, you know, eligible category. That's perfect. Thank you. Another question that came in here, uh, one of our attendees stated that they think it's important to also assess how compliant patients are with post-op care. What led to the infection in the first place, for example? And so I think that's a great discussion point as far as do we decide to offer them other treatments if we know that perhaps there's been issues in the past or how do we assess patient compliance? Do you guys have any tips or tricks that you have used when seeing patients over the years? Well, I'm just going to put this, oh, sorry, Brian, um, that for about a year and a half, I did house calls, and that opened my mind to non-compliance of patients. Like, I understand why you aren't compliant with your insulin. You can't even find your insulin in your house. So mm -hmm. it, when it's important to have that conversation in clinic, too, with patients, right, to educate them on post-op care, um, cleanliness. Um, especially in Arizona, it's hot, patients are sweating, if they're diabetic and they're overweight, like all of those things increase their risk for, um, for develop, developing a post-op infection. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll piggyback on that a little bit. So I think it, I think a lot goes into getting to know your patients, right? Like by the time they get to you, they've been through multiple other providers. I mean, I don't know how Camilla and Brian are, they're probably functioning a little bit different than I am. Um, but we see our patients in the multidisciplinary clinic many, many, typically many, many times and get to know them pretty well before we're going to offer them an implant. Now, by the time they come to the surgery side of things, you know, I may not know them as well, but that's the benefit of the multidisciplinary approach is that, excuse me, the neurologist knows them very, very well. And so they know if they've been compliant with their medications, their follow-ups, have they missed appointments, um, things like that. Yeah, I mean, from from our standpoint, you know, we go over the restrictions with them. I had one just the other day saying, well, I can't do all these restrictions. And, and how are you going to make me do it? Well, I'm not going to be with you 24 hours a day to enforce these restrictions. At some point in time, it's going to have to be the patient's responsibilities to follow the restrictions. It's a guideline for them. Whether they choose to follow it or not, that's ultimately up to them. Uh, you know, and if they have some cognitive uh, disabilities, then, then family members typically step up and help with that. But at the end of the day, I mean, all we can do is our best, and then it's up to the patients to have that own responsibility to take care of it for themselves. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Another question here, what are the speaker's thoughts on patients who have a spinal cord stimulation system that is working to provide 50% relief or maybe a little bit more than that, but they want it explanted just to get an MRI, maybe they have worsening pain and they wanna investigate further to see if something has changed in their spine or see if something else new or different is going on. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Let's let Camilla go first this time. Well, I guess the, the bigger question is if it's if it's providing them with pain relief of greater than 50%, then it's working. You know, whether or not they're having worsening pain, it's still working. So there's always the option to do a CT scan uh, uh, in lieu of an MRI if an MRI can't be completed. A lot of the devices that are on the market now are actually MRI compatible. The leads and the battery are MRI compatible. The, the, the risk lies in the fact that if they had a successful trial and a successful implant and then we explant everything and they want it re-implanted whether or not it will be covered by their insurance and so that's kind of the risk and i guess the conversation that you would need to have with that patient is if it's working and giving you greater than 50 percent relief we can do a ct scan and it might not be as good as an mri but it certainly will give us a, a picture into what's going on with that spine um, and then just letting the patient know that if they want to be reimplanted with a different device, that might not be covered. And I would I would second that. I would never encourage a patient to get something explanted if it was working for them, because there are other modalities at this point. So say they had an old implant, right? Like like she said, the newer ones are typically MRI compatible, and and you can find ways to get the imaging that you need with those systems. 
but if it was an old system and it's providing you know 50 percent relief get another image um that's that's what we if she had a system that had been functioning well and providing her that 50 percent relief we would have ordered a ct scan and done um, deep brain simulation using uh, ct guided um, imaging so the other modality you can get is a ct myelogram it's almost as good as an mri and it'll give you everything within the spinal canal, the the foramen, that way you can find out, hey, why is she having new pain? We had a, a patient that's been trying to get an explant for the last few months because she's got 80% relief, but she wants more. It's like, come on, no. <laughs> those, are, those are excellent suggestions, you guys. Thank you so much for that. Ashley, I've got one to throw your way. What are the most common post-operative complications after deep brain stimulation, and what does the recovery look like? So the most common, um, you know, I would say the typical things you would see immediately post-op would be pneumocephalus, and that can have a little bit of a headache, but as we all know, that goes away relatively quickly. Um, really, there, people do very well um, right in the hospital. So post-op nausea vomiting, I've seen um, pain control is very minimal after a stage one, which is the brain implant. Um, stage two, which is the battery, can be a little more painful just because you're tunneling a, a device from essentially kind of right behind the ear to the chest. So that's a little more painful. Um, complications, I mean, the bleeding risk is very minimal in the grander scheme of things. I would say about one in every 100 patients have a problem. Um, and of those problems, you know, one to two percent risk of infection, one to two percent risk of bleeding, depending on your target. Um, hardware complications um, can happen uh, here and there, not too often, more a result of a fall or a break in the lead or a, a loose connection or something like that. The biggest problem could be lead, lead mal malplaced lead or even uh, lead movement, so migration of, of the lead just ever so slightly. Um, that results in just enough movement to prevent them from getting adequate benefit. Um, the side effects that you see depend on where the, the lead is implanted. Um, so it, again, if that happens, you can always program around it. If, if you can't program around it, then you're talking about doing a lead revision um, if the patient is willing to undergo that procedure. Um, but those are the biggest, I would say, complications. Um, they're, they're minimal in the grander scheme of you know, neurosurgery. And sorry if you already said this, Ashley, but how long does it take patients to recover after those oh, procedures? So um, I typically say after stage one, which is the brain implant, um, a, a two-week downtime, and that's typically just the time between the stage one and a two. Um, so just take it easy for a couple of days. And then after the battery implant, I do ask my patients, and this all depends on their, um, their living and their activities um, or hobbies, things like that. But I typically say, a four-week recovery before you start slowly increasing your activities and again depends on the, the the job or the occupation as to how quickly we'll advance that but the biggest risk if you increase your activities too quickly um, is that you can cause a disruption in the battery placement and that can flip or rotate which would then um, or could kink or damage the wire good to know thank you for explaining that a bit more for us one of the questions that I have for the panelists, I think in this modern day where we have all these different technologies available to us to help with various medical issues, bladder stimulators, spinal cord stimulators, peripheral nerve stimulators, how many devices is too many? Do you have those discussions in your practice? Well, can I just share a personal experience? I have a patient that has a cervical high cervical spinal cord stimulator to treat atypical facial pain. And she's had that for about four or five years. And then recently in the last year was implanted with a lumbar spinal cord stimulator for, to treat low back pain and leg pain. And then she had had a partial knee replacement on her right knee and was having intense pain in her right knee. And so we did a peripheral nerve trial and she was excellent with the trial and was implanted. And unbeknownst to me, as she was in for her post-op implant for her knee, she said, oh, and I also have a trial going on right now for my bladder. <laughs> so she has one, two, three, she'll have four. <laughs> so I don't know if, I don't know the answer. I know she's getting good relief with each device and it's each targeting a different concern for her. So 
I'll open it to the rest of the panel for, for their opinion. It's like a lot of maintenance. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, she's like the million dollar lady, literally. <laughs> Ashley or Brian, any, any thoughts on how many devices is too many? Or Brian, perhaps in your practice, it's more how many procedures is too many? Uh, that's going to be dependent upon, you know, the surgeon to make yeah. that decision of, hey, do I want to tackle this? Because once, you know, it's the joke is with, with this with this uh, scalpel IV wed, because once we once we cut on them, they become ours and everything encompassing. Uh, and there's 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 some that it's. Yeah, no, we we stay away. <laughs> I think when you're thinking about procedures, it's, you know, what is the reason that they failed the other ones? Um, that's my biggest, well, that would be my biggest question is, you know, what, what is the problem and why have we done so many? And also what was their interaction with the provider, you know, basing, you know, their, their cognitive status and psychiatric issues, social support, things like that before we would ever, you know, implant something else. The most I saw on a patient, they had a DBS, they had a cervical paddle, they had a perk system at their cervical thoracic junction. They had a perk lead at the high thoracic and then a paddle in the mid thoracic. And then they also had the peripheral nerve stimulators and a bladder. And it's like, what do you want us to do with all this? There's, <laughs> what was the pathology for that patient, Brian? Uh, flip a coin, you'll get, you'll get a hit on any one of them. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for entertaining my question. I think that that's a valid question. Like I said, we're going to see patients coming in with more and more devices for more and, and more medical issues that they might have. And so I think some of those conversations will will start to come forward. It looks like we've answered most of the questions that are in the chat here. Audience, if you have any other questions that you'd like to answer the panel, we certainly have time to take another one here. While I am monitoring the chat for any last questions, I will say that we have our contact information listed on this slide here. So certainly feel free to reach out if this webinar brought any questions or concerns that you would like an opinion from our experts on, we'd be happy to speak with you. So while they're, while they're doing this, I know we had, we yeah. had personally talked about this as like our small group. Um, I would be interested to know if anybody who is listening has any input about what your practice does as far as different manufacturers of devices. Do you always implant the same device or do you go based on patient need, device features, um, longevity? Like what are the decisions, what is the decision pathway that you guys follow? That's a great question. While I'm watching to see if any responses come in here, I can speak to when I was working in uh, pain medicine, interventional pain medicine at Mayo Clinic, I worked with 14 supervising physicians or consultants. And so it was interesting because you could pose the same patient's case, their symptomatology, where their symptoms lie, what was causing them. And also I think dependent upon the physician's comfort level and experience with certain devices and working with their hardware and if they had had positive or negative experiences with implanting that device that might also play in with which device they would trend towards as far as the brand or the manufacturer and so sometimes I was like oh I know that they're going to say this device and I would feel really confident that I would have them all figured out and then they would say something different and I'm like you know what I can't figure it out <laughs> but I think certainly in smaller practices where you get to work more one-on-one -on -one with one or two supervising consultants, Camille, I know you're very close with, with your doc as well. I think you, you get a better handle on what their preferences are and get to figure them out a little bit. One of our attendees says that they're blessed with options in their region and able to make decisions on a case by case and not company dependent. Absolutely, absolutely. At Mayo, we always say the needs of the patient come first. And so I think that's why you get such a variety of opinions sometimes is that everyone really just has the patient's best interest at heart and wants to do what's right by them. 
We have a question here for cervical spinal cord stimulation. What is your routine insertion site for a cervical lead? Enter from the lumbar and go up or enter from the upper thoracic and advance upwards. Anything from the panelists here on that one? Uh, most of the stimulators that neurosurgery puts in are paddles. So we usually go in, uh, obviously we're already in the cervical, posterior cervical spine anyhow. So we either, if we're going to do it normally, then we'll go into the C3-4 area. Uh, if we're going to do it retrograde, then we go between the skull and C1 and use that to essentially anchor everything into place to keep the lean migration down. I know that the pain guys varies upon different practitioners. Uh, some of them will go through from the mid-thoracic, others will come all the way up from the lumbar. I would agree with Brian. In interventional pain, we use percutaneous leads, um, and typically we go upper thoracic. Um, very rarely will we go from the lumbar spine and, and thread the leads up. Usually it's, it's upper thoracic um, for lead insertion. Camilla, that was my experience as well, going in the upper thoracic and then threading upward from there. A couple audience members also responded to the previous question posed by Ashley regarding device or manufacturer preference. One attendee says for deep brain stimulation, they prefer the rechargeable IPG if patients are comfortable with that. Another said that the neurologist decides the device for deep brain stimulation. And let's see, I thought I saw one other one in there too. One of the practices, they primarily use three different companies dependent upon the pathology and the symptoms, as well as whether or not the patient would want a rechargeable versus non-rechargeable system. And so certainly, again, I think it's back to not only what is the implanting physician comfortable with, but what are the needs of the patient and what is it that they are wanting. So. That's perfect. With the last few minutes that we have left here, I wanna make a couple last minute announcements. So if we can advance the slide to the next one here, we wanna encourage everybody that's on the call, certainly consider becoming a member of NANS, the North American Neuromodulation Society. Especially if you're an APP, we would love to see you at some of our monthly calls that we do with our APP subcommittee. You can find information about that on the NANS website. We'd also love to see you at the annual meeting that's held in January. So know that we will be having an APP reception at the annual meeting on Saturday, January 14th. So we will have an opportunity to see one another face to face and we'd love to see you there. Our next APP webinar, which will be on a very fun uh, topic, will be in November. So stay tuned for more details on that. You'll see announcements on social media. We'll start putting that out there. If you're interested in getting involved in the NANS APP committee, we have that contact information there as well. Otherwise, like I said, you can find information on that subcommittee on the website too. Here is the save the date. We will be in Las Vegas at Caesars Palace and it is sure to be a good time. We're all excited to go see each other there. And with that, we thank everyone for their time, their engagement, their attention. Thanks for staying with us on this call tonight. We saw good numbers throughout our discussion. Thank you to our panelists for your time and energy in putting this together. And thank you for NANS for supporting APPs and striving to keep team-based care at the front. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us.